start with a story. Uh, I was talking with a lead designer uh, for Microsoft's Cortana, their personal assistant, about their design process. Uh, and this designer told me a story. We'll call him Elliot. And Elliot said to me, there was this idea to potentially work on and develop that if someone yelled at their phone or cursed at it, maybe we could make it run faster. I very quickly, this is Elliot, made a comment saying, I don't want to teach my children that yelling at someone makes them perform better. I want to use this technology to help build interpersonal social models. Now, this may sound crazy to everyone in the room. Who would, you know, this is perhaps an apocryphal story. Um, who would do that? It's, but it's actually not that crazy. And I think that Elliot, while not uncommon in the field of practitioners, is not the majority. Um, and in fact, this photo here comes from an article describing a potential technology that, would, um, that, that involved charging a phone by yelling at it. Right, so like this is actually, this, this, is, a real, this is a real kind of challenge that people need to be grappling with. So with that stage set, um, today I want to do a few things. First, I want to thank you all again for coming. Um, and I also want to think more deeply about the context in which Elliot and his team of designers are working and sort of what are the driving values and goals and environments in which it becomes a potentially good idea to yell at your phone. Um, and I want to do this because as critical practitioners in the room and especially as social science researchers here, we need to think about these decisions not at ju as just sort of stupid, misguided decisions, but really understand in order to change why the outcomes of particular ways of, of building technologies are actually structured from within the industry itself. And this is because if we want to have meaningful effects on the shape of technology, we need to be bridging the worlds of industry and academic research more strongly, especially social science research. And I think each side needs to hear and recognize the contributions of the other. And so as Dana mentioned, Tim and I were interested in finding ways to reframe some of the discussions that were going on. And so Tim and I set out on the research project that I'm about to tell you about. Um, we set out to kind of build to use it as building bridges between these kinds of practitioners and, and researchers. And um, particularly practitioners who are working in the field of intelligent systems and AI. So with that preamble, I'll give you a quick uh, preview of what's ahead. Um, first, I'm going to talk about what we talk about when we talk about AI and uh, why we're talking about it all wrong. And then uh, I'll tell you a bit more about the AI pattern language itself and some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from this interview-based based project. And then finally, I'll conclude by drawing out um, some more of the kind of more um, broad insights that I think we, we can develop from the, from the research we conducted with the pattern language. Uh, so what do we talk about when we talk about AI? If you get your information from, yes, good, sorry, I was looking at this. Um, if you get your information about artificial intelligence, machine learning, or robotics from popular news sources, your information is most likely wrong. Uh, this is especially true if you glean information from the headlines or the first paragraphs of news stories. For instance, this 2014 Wired article headlined, Artificial Intelligence is Now Telling Doctors How to Treat You followed a familiar pattern of using one small advance in technology, usually still in a testing or limited release phase, to extrapolate to all AI technology. And you know, I'm sure this doesn't surprise anyone in the room. Coverage of AI takes place at the extremes. AI will threaten the survival of humanity, or AI will save humanity. Um, but focusing on these extremes, I think, is needs to be more than just an observation. and leads to the insight that when we focus on the extremes, we draw attention away from the real and present technologies and effects that are taking place. And so moreover, when Tim and I thought about um, conducting this research, we wanted to not think about future, but rather what was happening now. Um, so OK, but, but what do we talk about when we talk about AI? Well, I actually really like um, Russell and Norvig's definition 
which says that the history of artificial intelligence has not clearly produced a definition of AI, but rather can be seen as emphasizing four possible goals. Systems that think like humans, systems that act like humans, systems that think rationally and system, sorry, systems that think rationally and systems that act rationally. So I think that this is a good kind of technical definition, but I think it's limited if our purpose is to sort out the social implications of AI, because AI as it exists in the world uh, is shaped by the social perceptions of that technology. Not only what it is, but what people think it is. Uh, and so part of our research for the pattern language, which I'll get to in a moment, this slipperiness of the term AI was actually a recurring theme in our interviews. And we actually asked um, everyone we interviewed what they meant when they used the term AI. And I think that this quote sums it up really well. Artificial intelligence tends to be both the scariest but also the most universal term. If I walk into a room and said, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, this was personal assistance, nearly everyone would have a picture in their head. The problem is that everybody's picture would be different. Now this is useful for marketing ideas, pitching ideas, but it can have unintended consequences for how the public understands technology and what its limitations are, right? Because robots fall over, they fail, um, and they fail in often unexpected ways. And we have to think not just about public understandings of technology and whatever that might mean, but the idea that lay understandings of technology inform local and federal um, government uh, agendas, right? So, and, and that can lead these kinds of governments to quickly adopt unproven technologies. So in sum, AI is blurry and nebulous and this vagueness is consequential because it allows us to confuse aspirations and accomplishments. So now onto the, the, the meat, the kind of AI pattern language itself. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the previous sort of perspectives that I've mentioned about AI came from um, work that, that we did on something called the AI pattern language, which we hoped would be a taxonomy of social challenges meeting technologists designing and deploying intelligent systems. What this means, what our goal was, was to articulate a series of common challenges that were emerging at the junctions between humans and intelligent systems. And not just what social scientists thought those tension points were, but really what people who were working in the field with technologies right now were understanding as the social problems they needed to address. Um, now, it's also, oh yes, that's the cover. And Dana didn't mention, but the books are for your taking. They are for free. So information is free in this case. Um, so I should also say the inspiration for this project um, came from uh, a really unique collection of architectural theory by Christopher Alexander, Sarah Ishikawa, and Murray, Murray Silverstein found in something called a pattern language and a timeless way of building, both from 1977. And in these works, Alexander and his team developed what they viewed as best practices for designing a city. And the patterns that Alexander developed embody an aspirational vision of a beautiful and efficient city planning how to make beautiful doorways and pathways and living rooms. Um, and it's interesting to think that this pattern language was coming in response to the reigning paradigms of urban renewal and centralized city planning of the 70s. Alexander and his team wanted to create an alternative way to build a shared world. There's actually this really beautiful, beautiful quote from, it's, it's a lovely, very thick, very expensive book, but it's very, you can find it online again for free. Um, and there's, there's this beautiful quote from Alexander that I think really characterizes their approach. And it says, this is a fundamental way of viewing the world. It says that when you build a thing, you cannot merely build that thing in isolation, but also must repair the world around it and within it. So that the larger world at, that at one place becomes more coherent, more whole, and the thing which you make takes its place in the web of nature as you make it. So in a pattern language, Christopher's pattern language, the central problem is the built environment. 
while our goals were not as grand as the city planner, um, we, we really, Tim and I really took inspiration from the values of equity and mutual responsibility, as well as actually the accessible form of a pattern language. Um, this is not an academic paper in an academic journal. Um, and like those patterns, we wanted to create a common language of problems and potential solutions that appear at, um, in different contexts at different scales of intervention. Still, I should, I should point out that a significant difference in the AI pattern language is, not, is that the pattern, our pattern language is not meant to be prescriptive. That is, our inclusion of each pattern is not an endorsement of that pattern, but rather a collection as a means to inform, widen perspectives, populate this kind of mutual language. Um, so I briefly do want to just um, gloss over our methodology. Um, our methodology was interview-based. It was over the course of eight months. Uh, we visited AI companies and industrial labs, uh, intended industry and academic conferences, conducted in-depth interviews with over 40 individuals, some of whom are here. Thank you for coming. Um, and our method of selecting sites and participants was guided by an initial survey of the companies working in this space um, and, and the thought leaders, uh, which we gathered from other um, sort of surveying organizations. And then we proceeded through three rounds of interviews, each round gathering new participants through a snowball method of sampling. So given this uh, subjective and self-selective formation of the participant pool, the people we spoke with cannot be claimed to be representative in an empirical sense. Uh, we didn't explicitly seek out racial, gender, or age diversity, and consequently, the vast majority of people we spoke with were white men under the age of 55, which actually very much uh, reflects the existing um, representative uh, or is, a, is a, an accurate, relatively accurate um, reflection of the existing demographics of who's working in these spaces. Um, still, uh, still, again, we, we see this project, this research, as not prescriptive, but rather as a catalyst to begin the kinds of conversations that need to be having across uh, industries and domains. Um, so, we gathered, we, we organized our findings into four main challenges that we saw emerge across industries. As Dana mentioned, Tim and I were really interested in saying, all right, people are looking at uh, the kinds of, uh, looking at AI technologies, domain specific. What happens if we look across all of these sectors? And so the people that we spoke with ranged from, you know, people working on drones for farmers to robo finance. Uh, but across all of these domains, we saw four main challenges. One was assuring users perceive good intentions. Another was protecting privacy. Another was establishing successful and long-term adoption. And finally, demonstrating accuracy and reliability. I should say that these problems and tension points emerged as organically the, the problems that my interviewees, that our interviewees um, stressed as needing to be, as needing to be addressed, as seeing sort of within their realm of responsibility. And that's exactly what we were interested in capturing. Um, and so within each of these four challenges, we drew three or four patterns that represented the ways that different people were addressing these challenges. And so now I'll go through a few of these examples um, for each challenge. And I'm only sort of picking one pattern out of what is um, several in, in each challenge. Uh, so first challenge, assuring users perceive good intentions. In contrast to many discussions that occur in social science and even, even uh, government, or that used to occur in government, um, those we spoke with did not focus on the potential that their products might result in inequality or injustice. Perhaps because each founder um, or designer relies on the self-knowledge of their own good intentions, they believe that the product, they believe in the product and they, and they want it to do well. Um, still, Across sectors, cultivating trust between a user and a system was seen as the perhaps the foundational social aspect of designing and deploying intelligence systems. And the main avenue people thought about this challenge was through the idea of, of transparency. Uh, 
so what transparency means and to what degree it can be offered varied within the responses. Um, so for instance, uh, the first pattern I'll, I'll um, talk about or just touch on emphasize the way that trust can be achieved between a user and a computer by making the human visible in the interaction um, even, when the, even when the human can seem absent, even if it's personalized. That boiled down to show the man behind the curtain. So also for each pattern, I'll give a quick quote, which sort of can stand as, as an emblem for uh, the, the perspective represented in each pattern. So speaking about a discovery feature, a project manager explained how through the design process, they realized that they needed to make their product not feel creepy. And, right, and I'm sure anyone who works in this space knows that we talk about this a lot, actually. How do we make it not feel creepy? Um, it had to feel human. And he explained, we make it like a gift, a gift for you, each, you the um, user, each week. Sometimes we get it right, but like a human, the product can have good weeks and bad weeks. He emphasized, we want our users to know that our products are powered by people. Moving on to challenge number two, assuring um, or protecting privacy. Another really common um, challenge was, was this idea of what do we do about data privacy? And here there were significantly divergent views, um, the span of which is represented in the full set of patterns for this challenge. Um, you know, some people thought it was the bedrock of creating a good technology. That, and, and those people had particular technical and design processes to ensure um, privacy by design. Uh, one, one of my favorite quotes actually from, from this research uh, was a machine learning um, startup founder who said, privacy is still very important, is still a very important part of the founding of this country. And so man, I have a lot of things to say. Mm -hmm. And he did, we, we talked for a really long time. Um, uh, but many also found that the, idea around, the ideas around privacy were simply misguided. And so that leads me to talking about number eight. Um, ignore the anxiety around privacy, it's a red herring. So viewing privacy as fundamentally relative, which most of the people we spoke with agreed, um, a number of our interviewees held the view that focusing on data privacy is simply misguided. Uh, the founder of a leading machine learning company based in Silicon Valley explained that privacy is simply a historical construct and is mistaken as important today. He used the example of reactions to Gmail, and someone else actually used this example, um, to illustrate his point that when it launched, it was a really huge deal. And now, no one cares if Gmail reads your email. Um, he found that focusing on the notion of privacy held back innovation. He concluded, yes, there's a sense of impatience on my part. We will adapt to new technology, and we will evolve. Uh, the third common challenge, and of course all of these challenges are interrelated and um, can, you know, are, are sort of variously uh, constitutive of each other, uh, my academicness showing through. Um, uh, but the third common challenge was establishing successful and long-term adoption. And particularly it was interesting, um, the patterns we found in this challenge emerged around the concept of control, that is, how and to what extent should users of or collaborators with intelligence systems be in control? And actually this led to my favorite pattern of all, um, which is pattern number nine. Always ask who is being made the hero. So the first time I heard this theme emerge was early on in our interviews and I was talking to um, a human computer interaction designer and he explained, at the beginning of my career, I worked in an IT department and we were all about making people's jobs simpler. But that means their job isn't necessary. But everyone wants to be better at their job because being better is about adding value to the company. So ever since then, this perspective has framed how he thinks about, about the problem of integrating new systems into existing workflows and how the value of that new, of that introduction should be framed. Uh, a human factors engineer 
uh, working on a drone system, actually for farmers, put it more explicitly. Everybody wants to be the hero of their own story. And so in designing their intelligence system, the central question he and his team kept in mind was, how do you actually have autonomy under the hood and yet make the user feel like they're in control? If you have an autonomous or semi-autonomous technology coming in and they're not the hero, they're going to resist that. And so finally, challenge number four, demonstrating accuracy. That is that a product actually worked and did what it was supposed to do. And not just that it did what it was supposed to do, but that people believed that it did what it was supposed to do. Everyone cited this as a recurring challenge. Um, and one major obstacle in, in many ways was the technology itself. That is that these technologies are extremely complex. Uh, as, yes, um, as the founder of a machine learning company explained, there's so much mystique related to machine learning. There's a combination of the customers wanting to understand it as much as possible, but at the same time, assuming they can't get into the details. Because it's unknown, there's this powerful desire to understand, but at the same time, it's complicated. Even if you start explaining it to people, they will just kind of zone out. And so in, in order to address that challenge, the pattern that I'll focus on here is to explain the conditions of accuracy. One engineer explained that while some clients and users want to understand how this kind of analysis is better um, than what they're currently using, he, the, the engineer said, people just always ask, I want to know how accurate it is. Give me the accuracy. Well, in our case, accuracy is a really poor metric to know how good this API is because you have 111 categories. And we would say, great, we've got 45% accuracy. But they're like, 45%? That's terrible. I'm looking for something close to 100. And then we're like, no, wait, this was a young founder. Um, <laughs> No, wait, OK, hold on and think about it for a second. There are 111 categories. Many of them are very similar, like fitness and dieting. So they're like, give me a number that I can say is accuracy. Long story short, what the engineer explained to us is that we usually just come up with proxy numbers where we can give you the best sense that corresponds to what you believe is accuracy. Accuracy needs to be translated. OK. So what does this all mean? I've just presented you with a series of, hopefully, interesting patterns. Um, but if they're just illustrative and not prescriptive, uh, what do we really learn? Well, I would argue that we learn several things. Broadly, we learn what areas concern practitioners and how practitioners frame the problems that they feel compelled to solve. And I think the two insights follow from this. First, when we collect the set of challenges seen as needing to be addressed, we consequently see what's left out. And again, what is seen as not needing to be addressed. And therefore, 